Hi there and welcome back to Factorio for some more Crastorio 2 with Space Exploration and the third and final update of this week. So let's take a look into what's been going on here. As, as you can tell, we're going to be looking at Arcospheres a bit once again today. So Mike has been busily working around poking at the um, poking at the Arcosphere processing system and trying sort of just going in and you know bug fixing and that sort of thing. And one of the things he says he's done is down here. Apparently there was a link between I think I believe this inserter and probably these ones along here. I imagine the red cable that's coming around here just accidentally grabbed that one as well as all of the other one as well as the um, all the ones around here. And that meant that sometimes. When this uh, system down here is sometimes feeding through various Arcosphere signals, and so those would be going into here where they would be setting the filters and then passing them out here. This one is only supposed to be set by the filters, by the uh, thing running along here, where it in turn, where it picks one of these and will send that one and that one only as an output over here to set the filter. So you can see we're flicking through the various different types of Arcosphere here. I think this is actually going quite a bit faster than the inserter is actually moving back and forth, but it does mean we get a decent spray of all the different Arcospheres coming out. So yeah, it, 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 it's, gonna, it's, it's working. And and down here, that means we've managed to now build up this supply of all of the uh, different all of the different cards that go into making Deep Space Science 3 and loads of the catalogues down here, so that's going really well. And that means all of the Arcospheres are then just drifting merrily past all of these machines because they don't need any more. And then coming around here where they can be made into other interesting things like the, uh, the Tesseracts and just generally anything else that's required along here. So it's supposed to run through and release one of each Arcosphere and then repeat, so you get sort of, it, it alternates through the entire list of them. Um, I'm not, it's very, very hard to tell from here how well that's working. But all the machines down here seem to be working, and these, these four do require all of them between them. So, the gen in general, that does seem to be working quite nicely. I did notice that if you look through the recipes here and check which um, Arcospheres are outputted, um, one of the ones that never comes out is these, the Zyze. And because between them, these ones take in all of the Arcospheres and then spit out a selection of them which isn't entirely balanced. Uh, that means that sometimes down here, this machine can be starved of Zyze, as you, as you can see is happening at the moment. Uh, which is a bit of a shame, but as the uh, next stage of using the catalogues is reliant on the Tesseracts being made, it's not the end of the world because eventually this will back up and, and it'll stop it, it will stop it working. Possibly if we could get this feeding them out a bit quicker so that we could get the Zyze past these machines while they were still running, then maybe that would allow more to come over to here to work. So perhaps this should be upgraded to a superior filter inserter, because then it'll swing back and forth a bit quicker. We'll get a slightly faster rate of um, Alcospheres being passed out along here, and maybe that'll work a bit better. I guess that, I think that's worth trying anyway, to see, to see if it does work well enough. And if not, then maybe having a second one that's passing them out would be useful, but it's kind of full all the way around the edge of here, so I'm not sure if that's going to be practical. Mike also discovered that the uh, when you move on to the uh, making the Tesseracts, at that point you start needing to use the inversion recipes as well, or at least one of them. So Mike has been thinking of the Arcospheres in two sets. There are the, there's the top set, ZTGO, and the bottom set, LXEP. And each of these folding recipes will take one top and one bottom and turn it into one top and one bottom. And all of these recipes across here will take in, I think it's usually two tops and, and turn them in, or They'll, t they'll, they'll take in an equal number of tops and bottoms anyway, so that, that means that the, the number in the top and the number on the bottom stay balanced, and therefore you can keep it um, organised and even just by using the folding recipes. However, making the tesseracts over here takes in and then gives out different numbers of top and bottom, so, so that manages to unbalance it. And at that point, you need to start using the inversions in order to bring it back from the unbalanced uh, state back into a balanced state as well. So he's had to turn these ones on, and uh, now he's started making the tesseracts, and it, it's working. We are keeping the uh, system over here in a reasonable level of balance. You can see it's not quite perfect. We've got five epsilons, and there's a couple missing on the end there, but that's because the system's quite busy. It's eaten up a few of them. In general, the, the system is mostly working. If we look down here, we can see we've got ten of the zetas and only three of the Zyze, was it the other way around? I'm not very good at those particular two Greek letters. So it's struggling a little bit over here, but most, it's it's sort of working. It's keeping it more or less balanced, but unfortunately it is only more or less. It's not quite, it's not quite perfect, but you know, it's probably good enough, probably close enough. He does say that with the Tesseract production running, the stable state is about 75 to 80% of the top type and 20 to 25% of the bottom type. I guess that means it just sort of, because with the Tesseract running, with the Tesseract production running, it's pulling some of them over from um, bottom to top, and therefore that's giving us the, the imbalance we're seeing along here. And so then we need to keep, just keep running the, the appropriate inversion recipe to bring it back into, into balance again. He then did a little bit of babying of the uh, the Deep Space Science three cards along here to try and get them in, into the into the well into the balanced state it's in at the moment. So as you can see, it's all ba all backed up now. These machines are all balanced. So I assume he was just nicking some of the spheres out of them, putting them back into the system, and so on. And so they're all running in here. And, and this this means that now we we are balanced. So every time this runs, all four of these will run once, and 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 um, and the and the supplies along here will will just carry on staying in balance, which is quite nice. He says he's also sped up the clock that's running along here from. Um, 
300 ticks to 200 ticks. That might be why this inserter here seems to be struggling to keep up. In fact, I'm going to drop an upgrade on that. I don't know if we actually have the um, the appropriate type of inserters available. Let's have a look. No, no, we don't have those. So uh, doing that upgrade would require making a uh, superior filter inserter. But I think it would be worth it. I think getting this up to, I think getting this running a little bit faster would give us quite a big uh, advantage. And looking further into his notes, Mike has said that he believes the current imbalance and issues which he's having over here is due to the uh, the balancing system over here not being able to keep up with the rate that the test rack production is um, is stirring things up and causing problems. So it's yeah, it. It's, 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 it's doing okay, but it is struggling to keep up completely. And there is, we, we've got one or two at the bottom end there, and I think it might be gammas that we just don't, yeah, we just don't have any of right now. So the system is struggling a bit. Maybe some more speed modules in here would, fit, would, would, would make things work a bit better. I do notice that these are only tier threes in all of these machines, and in presumably in the, uh, in, in the beacons around here as well. So I think maybe upgrading all the speed modules in the, in the folders and in the, uh, in the beacons that are, that are covering those would be quite good. Uh, over here, Maybe this one as well, because these are idle most of the time, so it wouldn't really matter. That would just affect number five here. And then not speed up the Tesseract production quite so much. Um, because whilst we do need a Tesseract and we need to produce them at quite the rate, uh, we, also need to, we also need to balance that with the rate we're rebalancing the Arcosphere at over here. So, yeah... It's a tricky one, but um, I think I think at the very least putting in more speed modules over here, maybe even upgrading these to the wide area beacon twos, so we can get even more speed out of these would help a little bit. That said, maybe I'm wrong about that because looking at these machines, they are not running all of the time, so therefore I don't think putting speed modules into them would help. I think the problem here might actually be the amount of time it takes for the uh, for the arcospheres to make their way around on the belts instead. Perhaps upgrading all of these to deep space belts would help. Uh, just to move them around that little bit quicker. And also putting in a lot more Arcospheres would of course help. Which, to be fair, Mike has been trying to do, and this caused a, uh, a slight problem. Mike has been using the Caladrian, our, com our deep space uh, capable, combat capable ship for uh, for all of his um, Arcosphere hunting needs, should we say. And it's, it's a good ship for that because it's got lots of engines on the back of it, so it's nice and quick, it's got good power generation, it, it can defend itself, although that's completely irrelevant, and there's plenty of space in it to put down a few chests that hold holding things like the Arcosphere collectors and the rocket silos and so on. So, yeah, I mean, it, 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 it's a good ship for that sort of thing. However, unfortunately, a couple of weeks ago, I borrowed the beam emitter uh, that was charging the ship up when it's in orbit for... I can't even remember what I borrowed it for now, but I, I had a good reason. Oh yes, rather ironically, it was for testing how much um, power we can actually send out to Fenestra. We use it using a beam transmitter. So if we look at looking at the... Um, places we've gone to. We've got the various planets along here where we can get crazy amounts of um, throughput if we, send, if we send heat power out to Agnea with a beam. Out to Snowdrop it's not amazing but it's still about sort of 20-30%. Out at Stardust I think it was something like 10% and then out in Fenestra it's unfortunately it's down to about a third of a percent. So because I disconnected that while he and, and then he did a few flights back and forth going off and getting Arcosphere's, um, he got to the point where the energy beam receiver in the middle of the spaceship had actually got down to being very, very cold. It got down to 5,000 degrees C, which is insufficient to make these make these high temperature heat exchangers run. So this ship is, is kind of stranded now. And so in order to sort of try and fix that, well, obviously we've pointed some beams at it now. We've got, I think we've got about three different beams firing at it. But because it's only a 0.3% um, uh, transmission efficiency, even after most of a stream and a bit longer as well, we've only gained 467 degrees C on there. So it's, it's still really struggling. When we just pointed them at it, it was, it was even worse than that because we had this uh, heat exchanger was still plugged in like that. And that was running um, the systems around here. It was, it was turning, the, uh, turning the heat into steam and then producing a little bit of electricity. And that, was, and that was powering up the shields and so on around the ship. And that was actually using up the power more quickly than we were capable of, um, than it was being brought in here. So the temperature was actually dropping, as you can see there over on the right. So the easy fix for that was just to disconnect the heat exchanger like that. And that means all the power that's coming in is just going into the uh, energy beam receiver and it's just staying there and gradually warming it up very, very gradually. So I think we want to get this to at least 7,000 before we even consider trying to fly the ship back. Because if it get, we were very, very lucky that it got stuck in Fenestra and didn't get stuck somewhere out in deep space because that would have been far more awkward because we wouldn't have been able to get the uh, fire the beams at it. Interestingly, the steam I let through has now just suddenly produced a little bit of electricity, which has woken the entire ship up. That's I'm surprised by that delay, but I, uh, I I don't know. I don't know. I don't know what caused that. 
So this is a tricky one to rescue. We floated a couple of ideas during the stream, one of which is to come out here with a, um, an antimatter reactor and plug that directly into the side of the energy beam receiver to produce the heat that way, and that would heat this up, and we'd then be able to get this nice and toasty, which would mean it would then be able to fly the, fly the ship back again. That would pro probably, if we do want to go and rescue the ship, I think that's probably the best way. Another possibility that has occurred to me is that we could put normal low temperature heat exchangers onto the side of it and those would produce the low temperature steam which would be enough which would be allow, allow these uh, condenser turbines to run and so that would produce a small amount of power and if we de disconnect if we de uh, removed or de disconnected deactivated all of the shield generators then I suspect that might be sufficient for it to limp home. Um, it would certainly be an interesting one to try, but to be honest, I think probably putting in an antimatter reactor on it is the better idea, except that we don't have an antimatter reactor, so may maybe that's not such a great idea. <laughs> if we look at the power consumption here, you can see that the, uh, yeah, oh, okay, we're charging up accumulators, but apart from the accumulators, the uh, ch the shield projectors are taking quite a lot of the power. That's 16 megawatts out of whatever, we're, of, of whatever we're able to produce, or in this case, take out back out of the accumulators. So the shield projectors are the big problem, Although we, I do note that we also have um, a number of other things like the uh, the laser turrets are under and the, the pylons are taking a certain amount of power. Nothing like as much as the uh, shield projectors and those are nothing like as much as this is, this is still, oh, still the accumulators. So yeah, pulling out the uh, shield projectors I think would make quite a big difference there. In fact, if we look back over 10 hours when the ship was working properly, you can see that the shield projectors, yes, they're in their idle state, they're using about 12, 13 megawatts. The lasers, uh, that was laser artilleries were using 3.3 megawatts so we don't, and we don't even need those. The laser turrets even in flight we're only using sort of one megawatt so I think that's going yeah I think removing the shield generators and relying on the lasers because there's a lot of lasers relying on those to protect the ship should be okay and so yes this is it, it's a little bit problematic we will have to decide whether we want to just wait and leave it whether we want to recharge it with a antimatter reactor or whether we want to try and run it off uh, low temperature steam either of the latter two will require an, an, a rescue mission to come out to Fenestra but we do have the deep space exploration ship available which is certainly perfectly capable of flying to Fenestra with a load of bits and pieces and, and cobbling them onto here to try and to try and get this working again. Another possibility that's just occurred to me would be to park the um, the, the the deep space exploration ship next to it here, and then demolish stuff all the way through the middle and run a high temperature um, naquium heat pipe from the ship to the from one ship's uh, energy beam receiver to the other one. That would also allow us to then cook this one back up to a slightly higher temperature just by pulling the heat out of the other one. We'd want to be careful about that though because if we, because worst case is we end up with two stranded ships and then we'd feel very very silly. Uh, so let's try not to do that. <laughs> Speaking of Mike and problems. Uh, Tristan also discovered that Mike had snuck some uranium into his pocket so uh, I imagine at this point Tristan has enough shields and things that his, uh, his health wasn't actually going down, it was all just being absorbed by the shields. Although how that works when the uranium is on the inside of the shields I'm not sure but he certainly didn't, he didn't take a death from it he, I think he ended up going back out of Navsat view where he'd been working on something else and wondering why there was a clicking Geiger counter noise when he, uh, when he went back to his actual uh, body rather than just looking at things through the Navsat. The other notable thing that happened in uh, this week's stream is related to the uh, the Stargate. So we started doing research into the long-range star mapping. We've done the first five of them. And each time you do one of these, and they're fairly easy researchers, although they take a lot of astro, and each time you do one of these, you get an entry in the Informatron telling you about that you found an interesting pattern of stars, should we say. And it says it probably doesn't have a practical use, but I think it's actually going to be related to the um, the archaeological endgame puzzle. And so you can see that because we've run, run five of the researchers, we found five of these uh, five of these patterns and five sets of coordinates. Uh, these coordinates are all given as an SV, which is a standard vector format apparently, which is aligned on the cosmic background radiation. I don't think the exact meaning of it matters too much, except in that it tells us we've got these three, th yeah, three numbers for each one that tells us where it is. Mike noted that if you look in the exploration journal down in the um, in the anomaly ship log, so that's the ship that we found here over in Fenestra. We, when you arrive here, you get this log entry in in the Informatron in the um, in the journal, and in here it also contains. A number of these uh, SV coordinate systems here. So, so it appears that to get out here, we may have, we either use the projection vector this 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 number across here from who knows, but that seems to be the target is the the Wooby Galaxy and the Fenestra anomaly. So that brought the ship here, which is where it then had a crisis. So does that mean if we put these numbers in? backwards perhaps it's somehow into the gate somehow then maybe we'll get a wormhole that takes us back home again I'm honestly not sure but this seems like a possibility uh, we do also find that we've got the access code here but I think that's okay I think that's sort of something we've already dealt with because we've uh, we've gone into the into the ship and had a look around notably down here at the bottom we also have the distress message sent entry which says we sent a message home and it's um 
it confirms what we feared. We were alone in this part of the galaxy. You need to find, design, and build a spaceship capable of taking me home. So that refers, I suspect, to the victory ship. So you build the ship that can go fast for a long time, etc., etc., and that is counted as the ship that can then take you home in a decent amount of time and is the escape. And that's how you complete the game. Perhaps the alternative method of completing the game is getting the Stargate up and running in such a way that you can use that to get you home instead of using the victory ship. So if you if you can work out from all of this stuff um, how to get the how to get the Stargate to point back home, that might be the way to do things. The other notable thing is we have these various different um, symbols here that we've discovered. And also we've been out to a few of the pyramids on some of the planets, and those all have symbols in them as well. I'll, I'll stick a couple of examples on screen here, and we can try and go, hmm, do any of these match up with the uh, star systems we spotted? Because they, they were definitely patterns, but I can't remember exactly what they looked like. So we'll have a quick look at this in the, in the, in the video and see if this looks like a, a thing we want to um, be aware of and think about. Mike has also noted that the fact that we found a Stargate suggests that the um, this, this 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 puzzle may be a little bit influenced by the film and TV series is a Stargate, and that seems like a reasonable assumption to me. And we have done a bit of research. Mark asked if we could do the Stronger Explosives 11 research to make the Spidertrons a little bit more dangerous, because Spidertrons fire out explosive rockets, and uh, this, this this will in fact make them more dangerous. They get a, a significantly bigger boom from uh, rockets and uh, rocket systems in general, apparently. So that gives a 30%, that's even a 30% boom to a nuclear turret rocket. That's uh, That's pretty impressive. And we have noticed that the nukes in this game are quite a lot less powerful than they are in Vanilla Factorio, so maybe this will help bring them up to that le bring them up to a slightly more useful level. Um, although that said, we do already have the Plague Rocket, which apparently also has its damage boost boosted by 30%. I don't know how you can boost a damage that kills absolutely everything in an entire planet by another 30%. Uh, maybe it kills anything a, a third of the biters on the next planet over as well. I don't know. We uh, I suspect that actually doesn't happen, but it'd be interesting if it did. We did long range star mapping one to five, as I said. That's uh, two through a lot of the, uh, the astro science, but that's fine, that's what it's there for. And it started us using the Deep Space Science Packs, which is why we got the, uh, the Naquium running again a bit, and why I was able to um, make sure the system was producing at least a bit of it and working reasonably well. And it turned out it was only kind of working. We made a start on energy weapon damage, um, but then we decided that actually because it requires 34,000 researches, and we, I think we ran out of Energy Science 4, uh, we decided that actually perhaps we'll put that one on hold for a little while. So we've done about, is that, we've done, oh, it says at the bottom there, we've done 41% of it. So we are part way through. We've done quite a, quite a decent chunk of it, uh, but there's still quite, there's still a very, very big chunk left to do. And as I say, we ran out of those. So we'll come back to this at some point when we've got a few more of the, uh, the Energy Science 4s available. Similarly, we did the same thing with Mining Productivity 12. We got 14% of the way through that before we ran out of Bioscience 4, and then once again decided to switch over to things that uh, we, we were actually going to be able to finish like oil conversion, and this is the one that allows you to turn oil into matter and matter back into oil. So, yeah, it's sort of potentially useful. If we ever have more oil than we know what to do with, we can turn it into matter, and if we have a crisis, I suppose we could consider turning it back from matter into oil, but I think we'd rather go off to an oily moon first and start mining it from there, because I think that's just going to be better overall. Similarly, we did mineral conversion, which turns uh, imacite into matter, or possibly matter back into imacite, again at the cost of a bit of a matter stabilizer. So. The, this this one is slightly more tempting because I believe we do already have an imacite processing facility on Norvis because of uh, Mike's attempts to harvest absolutely everything off Andrigan and therefore it's not going to require quite as much logistics to get it dealt with and we do have quite a shortage of imacite a lot of the time. However, it's still going to have the problem that's going to churn through matter stabilizers and I'm not really convinced that's worth it. Once again, stone conversion has been done so that's turning, oh apparently turning quartz into matter, not stone into matter. But you can then turn it, you can then turn matter straight into glass without having to cook the, uh, the the sand, which is interesting. And you can turn si uh, mat si matter into silicon. So that's, that's interesting. So it's interesting that those three are all different, different recipes. It's not turning stone into matter, and it's not turning matter into stone. It's turning them all into stone-adjacent things. So that's different. Again, I don't expect us to use that very much because we get through a lot of stone in our factory, so I don't think we're ever going to have any spare. But it's nice to know that we can uh, turn it into matter if we ever need to. We then moved on to advanced copper conversion, advanced iron conversion, and advanced oil conversion. These ones are actually quite interesting because they allow you to turn matter, in this case, into plastic or, or uh, sulfur, uh, iron plates, steel plates, or copper plates. So rather than doing this one, this one CC turns it into copper ore, but the advanced one turns it directly into copper plates. Now, because this again uses the matter stabilizers, I don't think it's going to. This is going to be a, a sensible and worthwhile way of converting, um, of cooking the the the, um, the copper ore, unless it produces an enormous amount. So let's see. You turn one and a half matter for each copper plate. 
Over here, you get one matter for every two copper ore. So that's three copper ore to make one copper plate. So this is actually a more expensive way of doing it. However, if it allows you to turn all of your uh, ores coming in into, into uh, matter and then turn them back into whichever plate you want, it's, it's to be honest, still not actually not all that useful. But it's an interesting idea nonetheless. Finally, we've got started on Energy Shield Mark V and have got an, an, an unknown way of distance through it. It doesn't actually, I don't think this, this one doesn't seem to say. So an active one doesn't say. It only tells you if it's inactive. But that looks like about 15, 20% probably. So we're working, away, working our way through that one. Um, I would guess that we probably run out of the Astro Science 4 or possibly the Material Science 4 because those tend to be the ones that we run out of. Um, or actually, no, this could be down to the Matter Science problems I referred to uh, yesterday, in yesterday's video. That's probably why this one's actually stopped. But this will get us a better energy shield. Now, these are the ones that don't really work with the jetpacks. So we haven't, re we, we haven't actually been using them, but they could be potentially useful to put into Spidertrons or to, for when you're about to attack a pyramid because you can't really fly around inside a pyramid. So just charging in there with a load of these energy shields with the massive uh, number of hit points they give you, that could be quite useful. Um, other than that, not so useful in general because we're uh, you can't fly with them. However, however... Thinking about the way the game tends to go at this point, if we go to a particularly dangerous planet, we're probably going to either use a plague rocket on it if we want to keep the planet, and then just just wipe out all the life on it. In which case, we don't need you don't need to be able to fly around and do combat. Or we're going to be going to a specific planet that has a pyramid on it and landing the uh, combat ship when we've charged it back up again, right next to the pyramid, and then running out the door into the in, into the pyramid to kill the stuff in there. And the combat ship will deal with killing any biters in the in the area that are outside the pyramid. So it's quite possible that now we've cleared off Norvis, the only combat we're going to actually be doing is going to be inside pyramids, and therefore these energy shields could be very very useful. And so that brings us to the end of the research and uh, pretty much to the end of the video. So thank you very much for watching. Uh, please make sure you're subscribed to the channel so you don't miss out on everything else that happens. Like, for example, tomorrow there is going to be a stream where we should be carrying on fixing all of those problems I've been talking about in the last three videos, and also trying to push the push things a little bit further forwards. I'm not quite sure what that means. It probably means looking at the next science pack, or perhaps trying to bring the science packs up to a slightly a slightly better, slightly improved speed. It definitely means trying to get more Arcospheres, which means getting this, the, uh, the deep space combat ship up and working again properly. And I'm sure there's going to be many, many other things we need to fix. On Wednesday, I should be carrying on with uh, some satisfactory. So, again, as I said yesterday, last week I managed to uh, generate some aluminium and some quartz. So, it's going to be going off, putting in more stations, more, more sub factories, and trying to actually use those things for something useful. And then on Thursday, I should be releasing that video I've been talking about, uh, about Mike's uh, interplanetary spaceship transportation system. So the one that keeps all of our all of our goods running around between the different planets and makes sure everything works smoothly and neatly. It's, it's quite a complicated system because it's fun to design complicated systems. But it's also interesting to look at other people's complicated systems. And so that's what the video is all about. And I say that'll be coming out on Thursday for non-supporters. It's already out for supporters, so if you want to see it early, make sure you're a, a, a Twitch subscriber, a YouTube member, or a Ko-Fi donator, and then you'll get early access to it, and, uh, and get to see the blueprints as well. And then finally, at the weekend, uh, certainly Saturday, Sunday, maybe Friday again as well if I carry on talking too much, <laughs> we shall have the, uh, the usual update videos for everything that went on in the stream. So, as always, thank you very much for watching, I hope you've enjoyed the videos, and I'll see you next time. Bye bye.